This is for the ethics review class at Parker University. In this video, I'm going to talk a little bit about malpractice insurance. And let me start by saying I think it is an ethical duty, not a legal duty, but an ethical duty for professionals to carry malpractice insurance. Uh, the benefits of carrying malpractice insurance are that if you happen to injure somebody uh, out of carelessness or mistakes just happen in the way you practice, if something goes wrong, you want to have a fund of money in place to compensate the patient fairly. Um, now, it's certainly not there to compensate people who are making uh, uh, groundless claims, but you do want to have something there to protect your patients. The other benefit or big benefit of malpractice is that if a claim is made against you, even if the claim is groundless or it's a bad claim, uh, the malpractice insurance company will pay to defend you, they will pay to hire the expert witnesses, and they will pay to whatever court costs are necessary to defend the case. And if it's appropriate to appeal the decision, they will also pay the attorney's fees for appealing that decision. Some things you need to know about malpractice insurance. There's two basic types of policies that are issued to chiropractors. The occurrence policy and the claims made policy. The occurrence policy decides whether uh, uh, an event is covered uh, if the error in om or omission occurred while the policy was in place, then it's covered. A claims made policy, on the other hand, decides whether a claim is covered depending on when the claim is made. So even though the events may have occurred before the claims made policy, uh, that policy will still provide coverage if, uh, uh, if the claim is made while the policy is in place. On the other hand, if a, 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 an act of malpractice occurs while you have a claims made policy, but the claims made policy expires before the patient asserts their claim, that policy will not cover that malpractice. So the problem or the reason you need to know about these different policies, sometimes when doctors are shopping for bargains, they're trying to find the least expensive malpractice insurance, they'll switch from a claims made policy to an occurrence policy. And that creates a risk that there may be a gap in their coverage. They can avoid that gap by purchasing an endorsement for the claims made policy. So let me talk about how this works and maybe it'll make it a little bit clearer. Uh, in this hypothetical, the doctor has been covered by an occurrence policy since graduation in 2010. In 2016, January 2016, the doctor switches to a claims made policy. It's only going to cover events happening after January 1, 2016. Doctor is sued on March 1st, 2016 for an incident that occurred in October 2015. Which policy is going to cover the claim? Now, it may be it you initially think the claims made policy is going to cover it because the claim is actually made in 2016. But the claims made policy has that retroactive date of January 1st, 2016. That means if the event of malpractice, the error or omission occurred before this date, then the claims made policy offers no coverage. But it turns out in this case, the doctor's in good shape because in 2015, she still had that occurrence policy in place. And because that occurrence policy was in place, the occurrence policy will pay for this claim and pay to defend it. So the doctor in this case, switching from an occurrence policy to claims made, did not need to take any extra steps to protect themselves. On the other hand, if the uh, policies are reversed, uh, the doctor graduates in 2010 and purchases a claims made policy. Uh, and then in 2016, the doctor switches to an occurrence policy. Claim is made in March of 2016 for an event that occurred in October 2015. 
Now the problem in this case is the claim is made in 2016, but the doctor in 2016 had an occurrence policy in place. So the occurrence policy is going to look at when did the underlying negligence occur. The underlying negligence in this case occurred in 2015 before the occurrence policy was purchased. So the occurrence policy is going to deny the claim because the event of negligence, the occurrence of the negligence, did not happen while the policy was in place. So then the doctor looks to her claims made policy. The claims made policy covers claims if the claim is asserted while the policy is in effect. Well, the policy was in effect until the end of 2015, but the claim is not actually made until the following year in 2016. So the claims made policy is also going to deny the claim. So even though this doctor has paid premiums continuously since she graduated from chiropractic college, by switching from a claims made policy to an occurrence policy, the doctor has created a gap. Now, the easy solution is when the claims made policy is being, when the change is being occurred, that when the doctor is changing policies, the doctor should have approached the claims made policy company and purchased an endorsement for an extended reporting period. Uh, an extended reporting period for three or four or five years will probably be adequate protection for the doctor. But that adequate, that protection, that endorsement cost money. And of course, the insurance company is not going to sell that endorsement after the claim has been made. So it is important when you're making that change to look at buying that endorsement. Again, this happens often when doctors are bargain shopping. They're trying to reduce their insurance premiums. And sometimes they switch from one type of policy to another without realizing they're making that change and without realizing the consequences of making that change. Most graduates will see that claims made policies, at least initially, are less expensive than occurrence policies. And the reason for that is because there's very low likelihood that a claim will be made during the first year that you're practicing. But as you continue to practice, the premiums on the claims made policies will increase. And that's what may make it look like buying an occurrence policy may look like a bargain. But if you're not careful about factoring in the cost of those endorsements, the occurrence policy may not be such a bargain. So be careful about switching policies and make sure you, you follow appropriate practices or, or protect yourself by buying the appropriate endorsements. Some things to remember about malpractice. Uh, insurance, be sure you complete the application accurately. Sometimes people will try to save themselves some money on premiums by identifying an employee as a chiropractic assistant instead of identifying the employee as an associate doctor. Uh, having another licensed chiropractor in the office means the practice is probably doing well. It also means it's probably exposed to a greater risk of malpractice, and that means there may be a greater premium. Of course, the insured needs to pay the premiums on the policy. Be sure the policy premiums are paid. Be sure they're paid in a timely manner. You don't want to have your policy get canceled in a way that creates a gap in your coverage. The insured's also required to report claims to the insurance company promptly. My experience working with clients is that they're often afraid to call the malpractice insurance company. And I think the malpractice insurance companies actually prefer that you call them early and often. If something's going wrong, if you're worried that there may be a patient who's, who may uh, be claiming that you injured them somehow, you want to notify the insurance company early so they can investigate, so they can talk to witnesses as necessary while their memories are still fresh, and so they can guide you in perhaps avoiding or minimizing the risk that that unhappy patient actually goes about filing a malpractice case. The insured is also required to assist in the defense. 
Uh, it's not just about reporting the claim to the malpractice insurance company. If the malpractice insurance company needs to see copies of records or needs the doctor or his employees to testify, the doctor needs to cooperate and assist as appropriate in the defense of the case. Some clauses to be aware of in a malpractice policy. Of course, one that's fairly obvious is the policy limit. Now, most companies sell policies with several different limits, and it's up to you to decide what limit is appropriate. Uh, personally, I think for most chiropractic practices, a $1 million, $3 million policy is appropriate. Uh, if the uh, uh, networks you want to belong to require a greater limit, you may want to purchase a greater limit. But that amount of money is adequate to settle almost all chiropractic malpractice claims. And let me explain what the $1 million, $3 million means. The $1 million means that the insurance company will pay up to $1 million per claim. The $3 million means that they will pay up to $3 million for, if there's multiple claims, they will pay up to $3 million total during that policy period. Because mal chiropractic malpractice is so infrequent, it's, it's not likely that you will see multiple claims in a year. But if you do, you want to make sure there's enough money there in the policy limit to cover it. The other thing I'll tell you about these policy limits is the insurance company is obligated to defend the case. Once they're obligated to defend the case, that's a bulk of their risk, their exposure. So whether the policy is for $100,000 or a million dollars, they're still going, the insurance company is still going to incur that expense. So often you'll find that increasing the policy limits from say 100,000, 300,000, to $1 million, $3 million is not going to cost as much as you might expect. So even if you're thinking about buying a policy at the lower limits, I recommend that you ask for quotes at some of the higher limits so that you can evaluate whether it's worth a little bit of extra money to get that peace of mind. Uh, consent to settle. Some malpractice insurance companies and some of their policies provide that once you reported the claim, the insurance company has the right to decide whether to settle the case. Even if you object to the settlement, they may be able to settle the case over your objection. On the other hand, other policies have a consent to settle clause that says the insurance company cannot settle the case unless the doctor consents to the settlement. Now that can be important because in some states, if you have a malpractice claim against you, that gets reported to the Board of Chiropractic Examiners when it gets settled, and the Board of Chiropractic Examiners may pursue disciplinary action against that doctor. And some states provide that if a doctor experiences multiple uh, malpractice settlements, it may mean the doctor is no longer qualified or eligible to keep their license. Another clause to watch out for is an arbitration clause. Now, we talked about arbitration clauses previously when we talked about employment agreements, and, and I think when we talked about leases as well. The arbitration is essentially an agreement to employ a private judge to handle disputes between the doctor and the insurance company. If that clause is present in the policy, just be aware that it's there, and be aware that that means you cannot go to court to pursue a claim against your malpractice insurance company, you're going to have to go through a private arbitration, which means no jury and usually no appeal. A hammer clause uh, gives the insurance company some leverage to force or encourage the uh, uh, doctor to consent to a settlement. Essentially, the hammer clause says if the insurance company wants to settle for a certain dollar amount, the insurance company can send a letter to the doctor that says, you know what, we want to settle for $500,000, but if you don't agree to that settlement, we'll continue to defend you. But if the ultimate judgment is for more than $500,000, we're only going to pay the first $500,000, and you have personal liability for anything beyond that. 
not every insurance policy, not every insurance company uses or has those hammer clauses, but be aware if it's there. Now, typically it's not going to say in the heading hammer clause. It's going to have to do with settlement of claims, and you're going to want to read that clause carefully to make sure you understand what those provisions are. So that's a very brief discussion about malpractice insurance policies. I will tell you that the uh, insurance companies can provide you much more detailed information. Uh, certainly NCMIC on their website has extensive information about these clauses and about their own policies. And that may be something you choose to look at whether you're using NC NCMIC or not. So just a quick summary of what we've talked about in this ethics review. Uh, we started out talking about 12 licensing board rules. Now let me again emphasize that's not an exclusive list. There are other rules out there. Make sure you comply with all the rules. Those are just 12 reminders that you need to keep in mind. So for example, I did not talk about continuing education. That doesn't mean you don't have to meet continuing education requirements. They are there, know what they are, and make sure you comply with those. We talked about employees and employers, how to build an ethical culture, how to review an employment agreement uh, to protect yourself. Uh, we talked about leases and some of the clauses you should look for and the risk involved in an equipment lease. Uh, talked quite a bit about HIPAA. Uh, and even though I talked quite a bit about HIPAA, my discussion is nothing more than touching the surface of what's required by those regulations. Make sure you take the time as you build your practice, as you move towards becoming a practicing chiropractor, take some time to become familiar with the HIPAA requirements. Make sure you know which requirements are most uh, applicable to a chiropractic practice and be ready to comply and be ready to have documentation to show your policies and your compliance with those rules. Uh, business entities, uh, generally, I think it may be okay if you have no assets or very few assets to start off as a sole proprietor, but as soon as your business starts to develop or if you have assets that need to be protected, or if your spouse has assets that need to be protected, you should start by creating an entity, either a limited liability company or a corporation that will help protect you from some personal liability. We talked about malpractice, how infrequent it is, the four essential elements of a malpractice claim, and some risk management strategies. And lastly, in this video, we've talked about malpractice insurance. If you have any questions about any of this material, please feel free to contact me. Uh, you may send me an email at jgreen at parker.edu, or you may send me an email to my law practice at jgreen at jessegreen.us. Uh, look forward to hearing for, from you, and I hope this information has been helpful.